Today we're gonna look at a king in the Bible, probably one of the most famous kings. Even if you don't have much church background, you've probably heard of this king. His name is King David. The book of Psalm was written primarily all from songs from David's heart and things that he was going through, ups and downs of his life. Songs that we sing not just in church, but in the secular world. Um, Psalms have been written uh, in secular music. All right, so this King David, uh, he didn't have a very good uh, transition into his leadership role. Uh, in fact, the guy that he was replacing tried to kill him on multiple occasions. So you think you got it bad at work. At least your boss isn't literally trying to shoot you or throw spears at you, all right? But let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. And it starts out like this. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. And so what I'm trying to teach the church as we're studying on Wednesday nights is how to study our Bibles, okay? Don't just read through a story in the Bible just to get your Bible reading done, but ask questions at your job. Ask questions. And I know sometimes that can be annoying, but when you get to a place that you begin to ask the right questions, and it's funny, uh, we, we made some staff changes and brought some new people on the team, and, and we're in this conversation, and someone says to me, well, you just have to ask the right questions, and I said to myself, I don't, sometimes I don't even know what the right questions to ask are, let alone ask them. I don't have a problem asking questions, but I don't even know how to formulate some of these questions. When we're reading our Bibles, we need to look at some things, right? It happened in the spring of the year. What happened? What happened? We're going to look at what happened. And then it says, comma, at the time when kings go out to battle. Why do kings go out to battle? Why would kings each year, this time of year, go out to battle? And kings go out to battle to obtain provisions to fulfill vision. Kings go out to obtain provisions. Kings go out to conquer lands, to conquer other kingdoms, to bring the goods back into their kingdom. Okay, well, that's great, Pastor Mike, but you're teaching us information that we do not apply today. That is not true. You have battles every day. You kings in here go out to battle every single day. Your first battle, many of you, is waking up. That's a battle. Right? When that alarm clock goes off, some of you guys working in the city, your alarm clock's going off at 3.30, 4 in the morning. That's a battle. I don't want to get up. Right? It's a battle to be in a good mood and let the joy of the Lord be your strength as you're driving down 87 at 5 o'clock in the morning. The throughway, right? That's a battle. It's a battle to he who keeps his mouth, keeps his life, and keeps himself from destruction. It's a battle to keep your mouth, to keep your life, to keep yourself from destruction when it's so easy to come out your mouth, right? There's battles. There's battles that we go through. There's, there's ground that we're called to conquer as kings. Many people don't know that they're kings. And many people don't know that there's ground that they should be conquering in their life. That you should not be in the same place next year as you are this year. You should not be in the same place financially next year as you are this year. You should not be in the same place intellectually next year as you are this year. You should not be in the same place emotionally next year as you are this year. You might be going through some stuff this year, but that doesn't mean it needs to carry over into next year because we should be conquering some ground in our lives. It's the time that kings go out to battle. Now watch this. The kings go out to battle. It's this time of year, but David sent Joab and his servants. Let's continue reading. He sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. So he sent all his men, his right-hand man Joab, and all of Israel out to battle. And they won, they did great. They destroyed the people of Ammon and they besieged Reba. But David 
remained at home. David stayed home. Let me ask this question. Where should David be? But he's tired. But he's tired. He's been working really long hours. And he's, and he's behind on his Netflix series. And if anybody finds out that he has not watched Game of Thrones this week, oh, that got quiet. People were like, I don't watch that. Shondo. If this is the time of year that kings go out to battle, where should David be? At the battlefield. David's out of his lane. David's out of bounds. David's in a place that he shouldn't be. Shouldn't be here. There's another story in the Bible where Elijah decides that he's gonna run from God. He's gonna run from his calling. He's gonna run from his mission because Jezebel is after him. And, and God speaks to him. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing hiding in this cave? And in the same moment, we can ask David the same thing. What are you doing here when this is not where you're called to be? This is not the place that you're supposed to be at this moment. You are supposed to be at battle, but David makes, listen to me, David makes a decision to stay home and not be in the place that he's supposed to be. And it happened. Go back to the beginning of the sentence. And it happened. Something happened to David because he chose not to be in the place that God had called him to be in. This is where I find the tendency with the kings and priests. There's a lot of priests that are trying to do something that they weren't called to do. There's kings trying to do things that they weren't called to do. And we find ourselves all out of our lanes trying to possibly do and be something that we were never supposed to be or go places we were never supposed to go. We're really going to look at this on Sunday. I'm really excited about Sunday's message. You can figure out the direction that most sentences are going based upon the first sentence. Most of us today, when we're in conversation with people, we don't really listen to what people say. Most of us, when we're in a conversation with somebody, are creating our response while they're talking. Most of us are thinking about what we want to say in response to what they're saying instead of actually listening. And if you listen to most people's conversation, what most people are going to come to say to you, they will answer their own statement or their own question with their first sentence. Almost, almost 100% of the time, okay? And so we got to go back and look at the first sentence here. It happened. It happened. It already gives us like this negative approach to where this thing is going. Something bad has happened because David is in a place that he's not supposed to be. Instead of Instead of getting our Bibles and reading it all out, I'm going to summarize because it's a really long story. But David goes up onto his rooftop. It's a brisk morning. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice morning. He's got his pumpkin spice latte. The Times Herald Record magazine. And he's just going to sit out, read the news, sip on his latte. And as he looks over at his next door neighbor's house, there's this woman, and she's naked, and she's bathing on next door. And instead of him saying, Santo Jesus, hallelujah, instead of minding his own business and getting back to his latte and the news, he becomes a peeping Tom. And in this moment, the desire of his eyes now creates 
new pathways for his actions. I'm telling you this, everything that you've ever done started with a thought. Any action you've ever taken started with a thought. It was like a seed, it was conceived. Then we meditate upon it. We think about it for a long time, over and over and over. We think about it now. David was a man of decision. He was a man of action. He was used to making quick decisions. And in this moment, he makes a quick decision. Joab's not there. His other advisors are not there. He calls one of his servants and says, go get me that woman. Sends one of his servants, gets um, Bathsheba, brings her over wines and dines her shows her all the greatness of the palace he ends up sleeping with her she gets pregnant okay now whatever that happens all the time and around here right Bathsheba happens to be married now we got a we got a big it's one thing he did that with a single woman Already, though, he'd have to end up marrying her. But it's even worse now in the time that he did this with a married woman. So now he's sweating. What am I going to do? So he ca- her husband, Uriah, is one of the men out at battle. Sends a letter out to the head of the guard, captain of the guard. Send Uriah back. It's an emergency. They send Uriah back. David calls him into the kingdom. Gets him nice and drank up, drunk up, says, go home and have a good night with your wife. But Uriah knows where he's supposed to be. Uriah says, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be at battle with my men. How could I indulge in the pleasures of this life when I'm called to live that life? And he refused to go home that night. Now David's got a bigger problem. Because the dude didn't fall for it. You know, and, and back then, they didn't all watch the clock and know, wait a second, something doesn't add up on the timetable here. He would have got away with it. But Uriah knew where he was supposed to be. I just, I just wonder today, do you know where you're supposed to be in your calling in life? Because when you don't know where you're supposed to be, You start living a life that you were never supposed to live. You start making decisions that should have never been a decision to make. Hmm. So now what does David do? He's part of a cover-up. We've got to cover this up. But your eye didn't fall for it. Your eye didn't give in to it. Now we have to plot murder. David writes a letter. David is like... He's deep, he's got deep rooted issues, this David. That's why we can go back and look through the book of Psalm and see some of these mental uh, like torments that this dude went through. He pens a letter to the captain of the guard and says, send this man Uriah to the front lines. And when the battle gets at his highest, draw the troops back but leave Uriah out there. Make sure he doesn't come back. Right, so that, I mean, that's bad. But he seals the letter and makes Uriah deliver it. The man's riding the horse back out to battle where he's supposed to be with his own death certificate. But he knows where he's supposed to be. He's doing what he's called to do. He gives the letter to the captain of the guard. Sure enough, they have to obey the king, send him out there. And Uriah loses his life. Uriah loses his life. Now David is involved in murder. It's no longer just conspiracy to commit murder. It's done. It's done. So, long story short, the child ends up dying. David's distressed. Bunch of other things, a plague hits. Tons of other things happen. Here's one thing that happens. Maybe you don't know how far this story goes, but David has a son that ends up raping one of his half-sisters. I wonder where a son would get the idea that it's okay to take whatever you want. Okay? 
Can I ask that again? I wonder where a son gets the idea that it's okay just to take whatever you want because you want it right now. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm just going to ask questions like that, all right? I wonder where. All these things happened because of one reason. Ready? Put this up on the screen. Because David forgot why he was born. David forgot why he was born. This is one of those deep questions that will forever transform the trajectory of your life and put you on a solid path. If you can answer the question, for what cause was I born? For what reason? What is the purpose of my existence in the world today? What is the purpose of my existence in the world today? David, as a young boy, he's out tending his father's sheep. A prophet comes along, anoints him with oil, and says, you are anointed as king over Israel. David wasn't looking for it, but he was born to be a king. And kings go out to battle, and they conquer new lands to bring provisions back to fulfill vision. He forgot that he was born for the cause of the king and his kingdom. When he should have been planning his battles, he was planning his pleasures. When he should have been planning the battle, he's trying to figure out how am I going to get away with this. Now hear what I'm about to tell you, because this isn't bad. This is factual. Kings conquer. It's what they do. Kings conquer. It's what they do they do. That's why men chase so hard after their spouse. They want to win the prize. They chase after that thing. They got to go get it. They got to conquer it. They got to own that. That's what kings do. Females, we're, you're the same. Well, I was going to say we're the same thing. <laughs> you're the same way in the things that you're called to conquer, like the things that are in you that you know you need to accomplish, right? Kings conquer. It's what they do. But listen, you got to get this. But when kings don't know they are kings, or they forget that they should be conquering the enemy, they will conquer the wrong things. Kings conquer it's what they do. When you don't have the right thing to conquer, you will choose to conquer the wrong thing. Because kings conquer. Are, are we getting that? Any, any, any big decision that we've made, it was an idea of conquering. And, and when the proper thing to conquer wasn't there, many times we'll take the second best thing. Because I've got to be doing something. Do you know the greatest enemy of a king? What destroys more kings than anything else? You ready? Boredom. Boredom. You've made some of your stupidest decisions when you were bored. When you were bored. You broke most of your diets when you were bored. When you're sitting at home, watching TV, and you're like, I have a Freudian oral fixation. I need to just eat something. Instead of going and chewing ice, <laughs> you eat an entire bag of Doritos and salsa, and melted cheese. <laughs> Listen to me very carefully, ready? Be very careful of the things you choose to conquer. Be very careful of the things you choose to conquer. Here, here, here's, here, here's, here's a funny thing, right? Every single service for two years, bar none, I've always closed the service by saying, everything we set our hands to, let them prosper and be successful. There's no restriction on that. 
I've been very successful at doing the wrong things. So be careful of the things you choose to conquer because you just might get it. You just might get that thing. Whatever, whatever. I'm just trying to apply it. Whatever that might be. Money isn't always a solution. Money can actually create bigger problems for you. But yet, you know, we want to conquer. We want to win. David conquered Bathsheba, but that wasn't his high calling or his mission. Watch this. There is a constant battle for your focus. There is a constant battle for our focus, for what we are focusing. For some of you, you're already having a hard time focusing right here, right now. You're like, you got up at 3.30 this morning to go to work in the city and you're already shot and there's like this idea of focus, right? I'm telling you, this battle for your focus never ends. It never ends. David lost focus when he should have been out winning battles and fighting battles. He got distracted and he lost focus. Haven't you felt in the last 10 years that the days seem shorter? Like you can't accomplish as much in one day as you used to be able to accomplish? I was sitting back really thinking about that the other day and I'm like, gosh, man, I, I, I felt like I used to get so much more done and like the sun was up longer. And I realized that we are so distracted today by almost everything, right? We're so distracted that we carry these things in our pocket and we're at a point now where we feel it vibrate. We feel a text message and we pull out our phone and we didn't even get a text message. It's called phantom texting now. We feel phantom notifications that we're so in tune to, I have to be aware of my device that I make up. You know you've done it. You know you thought you got a text message. And you're I think to myself, then what the heck was that? Like, is my leg muscles now twitching because it misses having a text message? <laughs> it seems so much that like there's no time for anything. And the problem isn't time, the problem is focus. Every single day I face a battle for my focus. Every single day. I'm not, I'm not standing up here, trust me, when, when I deliver messages, I don't stand up here and preach messages based upon the fact that I have everything conquered that I'm saying. In me, I battle every day for my focus and I have to wake up very early in the morning and go into the office and spend time with the Lord to ensure that my focus is in the proper place so I don't say things that hurt people. With my personality type, it's very easy for me to say things and, and make decisions and not consider everything. And so for me, I've had to really wheel things back and prayerfully consider all the things I do, and it takes focus to make those proper decisions. And in this story, David got distracted. He forgot why he was born. Have you ever heard anybody say this? There's got to be more to life. There's got to be more to life. There's got to be something more out there. And you know, just, so, just if anybody ever does say that in front of you, like that's a really good entryway for evangelism because you have the answer to that missing piece. And all they're saying is they haven't found their high calling. Because I've even heard Christians say it. Christians who have accepted Jesus Christ, they have the answer, they have eternal life, yet... They're saying there's still something missing that I'm not being totally fulfilled. And it's because they haven't found their high calling. In Revelation 1.5, it tells us that he has called us to be kings and priests. Kings and priests. Two offices, two functions that we have in the body of Christ. Kings and priests. Well, how do I know which one I am? 
if you are not currently getting a paycheck from a church, you are a king. You're a king, flat out. If you are getting a paycheck full time from a church, then you are a priest, okay? This is what we are called to do. God puts you on earth, most of us in here today, to be a king. What does that look like? Kings conquer. It's what they do. How come some of us, many of us don't feel like we haven't fulfilled certain things? There's got to be more to life because we're not conquering things we're called to conquer. You're a child of God. That means you're not ordinary. You signed up for a higher calling than the just get by in life sort of lifestyle. Listen to me right now. You are not insignificant. You are not insignificant. We're going to look at this a little bit next week. I mean on Sunday. You are not insignificant. You were born for a cause. God Almighty knows your name. I mean, the creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, all the, the little tiny animals that we don't even know exist deep down in the abyss of the ocean knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head, or lack thereof, David. <laughs> he knows you. He's concerned about your life and everything that invo is involved in that. He fashioned, listen, he fashioned a life that is a perfect fit for your calling. But you must choose to step into it. You must choose to step into that life that perfectly fits you that he designed for you. That's your choice. Believe it or not, your happiness is affected by your place in the cause and your calling. Because, because we sit back and we say, I'm just, I'm just not happy with the things. And I, and I, get, I get that happiness is conditional, but, but so is you choosing to be in the cause of the kingdom. Every day, you get a choice whether to do the cause of the kingdom or not. Every day, you choose to let your light shine or shut it off. Every day. That's why he said, I'm not going to hide it under a bushel. But I'm going to put it out on the lampstand. I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to let my light shine. Which means if I could let my light shine, I could let it not shine. So there's a decision daily to fulfill the cause of the kingdom. This is why I believe a lot of people are not happy with life. They haven't found their vision. And I'm not talking about eyesight. I'm talking about an internal knowing of what lane they are to run in. Many kings, and I'm going to say this, and this is one of those things that may sound a little strange coming from me because I'm the one saying it, but you guys love me enough that I can say these sort of things. Many kings miss out on the greatness of their life because they don't have a priest who is in his high calling, speaking life and vision into their high calling. Many kings, many people who were called to be kings, many business people miss out on the greatness. They do good, but they miss out on the greatness because they don't have a priest in his high calling. See, can I, can I, can I get on my church soapbox for a second, Emmeline, is that okay? I have a problem with church. What church has become in America. I have a problem that it's become about filling the pews. My, my calling is not to fill chairs and pews and grow numerically who attends. My high calling is to fill hearts.
Anybody with the right marketing scheme can fill seats. But only a priest in his high calling can fill hearts. Hearts in a way that say, I, you, you can say, I can make a difference in the world today. I'm part of something bigger than myself. That I need to be in the house of God and I need to bring people with me because my heart is filled with the knowledge of who I am. Any one of us can open the Bible and find out who God is. But do you know who you are in view of who God is? And many kings don't ever step into that place because they don't have a priest in his high calling calling out the king within. I believe this is one of my main missions in life. Listen, I'm about to tell you right now. I refuse to sit back and watch people who could change the world let the world change them. I was a youth pastor for 12 years. For 12 years I was a youth pastor. And I sat back and watched as kids who were on my worship team who were baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in other tongues, laid hands on other teenagers and watched miracles happen. We watched blinded eyes open. We watched legs grow to a healthy length and fix scoliosis. We've had spines crack in our hands as scoliosis has been repaired. My teens in our youth group did these things. And in the first year of college, turned their back on Jesus because a professor in Satan's high calling convinced our kids who were raised in our church that God was not real. Kids who could change the world but the world changed them. I'm telling you right now the world ain't got nothing to offer the Christian. But kings stepping into their high callings the Bible says that the, that, the, um, that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. For the kings who are in their high calling. Has anybody in here heard of a midlife crisis? Maybe you know someone who went through a midlife crisis. Um, I'm about to turn 40 in February. I'm about to hit that midlife number. 40 is midlife in the United States. And I was going to, I'm just telling you what I was going to do because I'm not really going to do it. But on my 40th birthday around that weekend, I was going to come with a toupee. <laughs> Big old beautiful hair piece. <laughs> with long flowy blonde hair. Just like real, real edgy, real trendy, you know. And I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't even going to draw any attention to it. I was just going to come out here and be like, man, he's got a beautiful head of hair. I wonder where that came from. But, but around, around 40, right, 40, 45, generally men begin to question their existence. Right? This is what it stems from. Have I done enough? Have I accomplished enough? Am I going in the right direction? So they change their hair. They have to buy a sports car, Right? Go buy a boat they can't afford. Go into all sorts of debt. Many men choose to trade in their 40-year-old wife or two 20-year-olds. I'm just trying to say straight out what happens. David, need to be at battle, David. Need to be at a battle, David, because you're making some dumb decisions. You're letting stupid out the box. Put stupid back in the box. All right? But I don't think that midlife is the crisis. I think that we have a lack of vision crisis. A lack of vision crisis. I think that men and women alike get to the mid of life and we forgot what the dream was. 
We don't know what the next step is. We don't know what the next season is. Our, our kids are growing or grown. Our whole married life has been raising kids. I don't really even know you anymore. I don't even know if I like you anymore. And we lose the vision from where we once began. How did you get here? What are you doing here? Elijah, David, why are you going over to Bathsheba's house? Or why are you calling Bathsheba over when you're supposed to be out at battle? Kings, not knowing who they are and what they are called to conquer, will inevitably conquer the wrong thing. The Bible says, for this cause you were born. The cause is the cause of the kingdom. Listen to me right now. Put this up on the screen. If you don't have vision from God, the world will give you vision. If you don't have vision from God, the world will get, turn on the TV, read a magazine, open, turn on the radio, whatever. That, it is pumping your veins full of vision. Vision. Turn on some QVC, Home Shopping Network. It is pumping some vision into your veins. Next thing you know, you got to have the latest gadget gizmo that you can't afford. So now you're willing to trade in your peace of mind for some debt. Listen, when a king forgets why he was born, they start conquering things they shouldn't be conquering. They start buying things they shouldn't be buying. They're not in any position to buy. But they trade in. Somebody needs this. They trade in their personal security for an instant fix. Purchasing, when you have to purchase something on credit card that you can't afford, it's to fulfill an instant need, an instant fix. I gotta have this thing now. And now, stress anxiety every month when that credit card bill comes because you can't even keep up with the interest. When kings who were called to change the world have adopted the world system and now the world is changing them. Simply, just think about that. Just simply think about that. Now affecting the believer. Now we feel kind of bad, right? Oh my God, if he knew my credit card debt. I don't, I don't really care. It's, it's not my intention to make you feel bad. I just need to make this real. Because I'm telling you right now, this teaching right here, I, I, the, the message I'm gonna preach on Sunday, I don't think I could preach in any other church. I don't think, the things I'm gonna say on Sunday, I think other churches would run me out. I think people would leave other churches for the sermon I'm gonna preach on Sunday. And so if, if I'm gonna say this, my Sunday message, if people could leave our church because of the sermon on Sunday, they probably should leave our church. Because I'm called to call the king out of you. And that's not always comfortable. When we're in the gym, working out, you can ask any of the guys, the reason why I can't go to public gyms, I scream too much. I scream too much. But in that moment when you're bench pressing and I'm in your face screaming, you can get one more after you've already given me five one mores. And your chest is burning, your arms are shaking, you don't think you can do it. I'm calling greatness out of you. Sunday, greatness will be called out or a personal dissatisfaction with yourself will be called out. And that's why a lot of people leave church. It's not about the pastor. It's not about other people. It's not about offense. It's a personal dissatisfaction with himself. Now I want you to feel good. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it said it happened. It happened. 
All that, all that stuff happened because David wasn't where he was supposed to be. It, it happened. But I, wanna, but, but I believe that Wednesday night, Halloween night, God wrote a different It Happened story. For months now, we've been casting vision that we were going to go into our community and we were going to do something that we have never even seen happen before. We were going to go into our community and we were going to attempt to do something. And all we prayed was, God, everything we set our hands to, let it prosper and be successful and we're following after you. We knew that we couldn't do trunk or treat here anymore. We, didn't have the, we don't have the property for it. We even moved it inside into something called Seek a Treat so we could have more parking. And, and it got so big that, that it, it backed up the whole road. A car accident happened at the corner. It was just a scary situation. It wasn't safe. And I don't know if you knew this, but for two years we didn't do anything on Halloween because we didn't have the vision. I went to a conference and I heard a pastor at the conference said, <clears throat> stop trying to think that you have to do everything. Find out what your city is doing and make it better. So I was like, find out what the city's doing, make it better. Well, I don't even know, what is Middletown doing? Like, what can, what can we help make better in Middletown? And then I started thinking, okay, what can we do about, let's talk about, let's think about Halloween. We really wanted to do the trunk or treat. Maybe we could use one of the parking lots in, in the city or whatever, but then what if it rains? What if it's cold? And then I said, wait, I think the mall I think the mall used to do something with Halloween. And so we sat down and we said, could we make it better? Could we make it bigger? We began to design vision. What could this look like? How many lives could we impact? And then you know me, I come out my face out of nowhere and I said, we're going to give out 100,000 pieces of candy. I didn't even know how much 100,000 pieces of candy actually was. 100,000 pieces of candy is over one ton. Like, wait, a ton of candy. It's over 2,000 pounds of candy. Well, we don't even have a vehicle to move that kind. Like, we got a three-quarter ton pickup truck. It can't even hold 2,000 pounds. How the heck are we going to get candy to the mall when we come out our face? And We needed to enlist the help of kings. On Wednesday, Halloween night, kings and priests joined arms and went into battle. Not a fight against flesh and blood. But, a, but one battle was a battle against the fear of celebrating Halloween. The fear of being known as that church that celebrates Halloween. There was a battle. There's a battle there that we have to break the stigma as if the devil gets a day. As if. My Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He's saying every single day is the Lord's day. Somewhere along the line, candy became satanic. Maybe, maybe the calories. <laughs> the first thing we were battling was the religious spirit. Second thing we were battling was our fear of protection. Is it safe for a church with the shootings that are happening in society today? Is it safe for us to publicize this much that we are going into the community and trying to do something great? There's fear. We're battling fear. Maybe you battle fear. Maybe you were raised in a home that was controlled with fear. And everything you did and everything you said was, had a fear attached to it. It's a battle for you. On Wednesday night, kings and priests joined arms and we battled. We battled against the kingdom of darkness. Wednesday night, I walked around a lot. Wednesday night I saw, I saw kings step into their high callings. I saw men and women from this church show up at 11 o'clock in the morning and stay with us 
until 10 o'clock at night. I watched as they walked into the mall as average believers in Jesus, but walk out with a crown of glory upon their head, their chest puffed out, and a pride knowing that they put their hands to a vision and it happened. I saw kings arise from ashes, people who have been broken, people who have made mistakes in their lives, people who have a past start a new future. It wasn't, it wasn't maybe a moment of salvation, but there was a visible transformation in the hearts and in the lives of the people who volunteered during Halloween. Kings came alive. We handed out, Josh said it during offering, we handed out over three, th- I don't even have the actual number. We... We know that we purchased 3,000 bags and that we filled them and gave all those away and we had extra bags that we filled. So we don't actually have a specific number, but we gave over, out over 3,000 bags of candy. Now here's what I know. It wasn't about the candy, guys. It wasn't about the candy. It was about people saying, Who are you? Why are you doing this? Why a bag of candy with, and that was another thing, between 30 and 50 pieces? (laughs) Some of our, some of us got a little carried away back in the bags. We handed out over 3,000 opportunities. Opportunities for people to see a church website link and take out their mobile device or go home and look on their computer and search or type in our address. 3,000 opportunities for people to click on our media and watch a life-giving sermon that could forever change their life. 3,000 opportunities for someone to make a decision, say, there's something different about these people who were in the mall I want to see what's happening here. We had two tracks of vision. There were two wins that we were going after. We wanted to hear people say, this is a church? And we wanted to say, wow, you guys are so generous. And this happened. Play the video. Galleria at Crystal Run's annual Malloween is giving kids a safe and fun environment to get in their trick-or-treating. Stores handing out candy to costume trick-or-treaters of all ages as they make their way through the mall. This year, however, the mall hosting the Family Church of Middletown, performing musical renditions of Disney classics. And reaching out to the community to be a positive role model is what the church strives to do. Pastor Michael McKelvey says so. We have to be an example to those who are around us, an example in the way that we live, in our charity, in our conduct, in the way that we love. And so, you know, um, part of our mission is to get out of the community and show love when there's a lack of love in the world. There's a lot of fear in the world today. So we're here to show some love. And after enjoying performances of Moana and the Lion King, kids, excuse me, we're happy to get an entire bag of candy from the church's volunteers. So did did you catch the very last sentence? Kids were happy to get an entire bag of candy from the church's volunteers. Now, we didn't even know they were showing up. Some of you guys understand about family churches that we're not we're not the church that takes selfies while serving. That's that's not the point by which we did it. Our whole point was maybe somebody would look up the website link and come to church. Because we do church, our lane, we do church really well. And so really what we did was we just took what we do at church and did it at the mall. I mean, that's all we did. It's not like we tried to do anything special. 
We said our win is going to be that people saw the generosity of kings. And that is the exact terminology that the writers of that article chose to say. Kids, now let me reword it to what he didn't see. Kids were happy to receive a generous bag of candy from the church's kings. That's not possible. What we did on Wednesday is not possible without kings saying yes to their high calling. We can't do church the way we do church without kings saying yes to their high calling. We can't do children's ministry the way we do children's ministry without kings saying yes to their high calling. We can't serve our community the way we serve without kings saying yes to their high calling. Mm. How do kings serve? By their donations, by their, by their gifts, and by their talents. By coming in and volunteering and being part of how we run and how we do church. Stay focused. You have a high calling. It's easy to be distracted by life. It's easy to be distracted by problems. Remember, you were born for a purpose. You were born for a cause. Not by accident, not insignificant. Tonight I wanna pray. I wanna pray tonight that Maybe you have not found your high calling because as of today, you haven't made a decision for Jesus Christ. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray in a moment for salvation. We're gonna show you how we do that here at Family Church. But I also wanna pray for something else. Maybe, maybe in your life, the it happened is a lot like the Britney Spears song. Oops, I did it again and again and again and again, and it happened again, and it happened again, and it happened again, and I promised God I'd never do it again. Oops, it happened again. Instead of the wrong thing happening again and again, could we make an internal decision to say yes to the high calling? To say yes to what God has called us to accomplish in the world today. Listen, let me just tell you, many of you have found your high calling in the marketplace, in corporate America, that you are called to bring a light, but maybe you forgot that. Maybe you forgot that you were the light for the cause of the king and his kingdom right where you are. But it's so hard, yeah, you're in a battle. And it's the battle to obtain provision for the vision. Jesus warned us, yeah, it's not gonna be easy. There's just going to be some times that being a Christian and letting your light shine is going to stink. But you have a cause. You have a purpose. I'm going to pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will help you and guide you. That he would lead you. That some of us need to do what Paul did. He said, I had to shake some things off. I had to shake off the past. I had to forget what's behind and press towards the prize. The prize is the high calling. I'm pressing towards my high calling. Maybe you haven't stepped there yet, but you're pressing towards it. So could we do something a little bit different today? Could we hold hands all across the room? I know that we're not so used to touching people in New York, but we have Purell and hand sanitizer in the lobby as soon as we're done. First, I'm just going to pray a general prayer over our health and our vision, our emotional status. New Yorkers are so emotional. You ever see, notice that? Like, we're so emotional, but it's good. Like, we get really good emotional things, and then we, anyway, I'm emotional. And then secondly, we're going to offer salvation, all right? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for tonight. I pray, God, that in, in, inside of us, we're feeling 
the call of the king being drawn out of us. That we're recognizing within ourselves who you created us to be, that there is an innate purpose, there is a calling upon our lives, that we were born with a purpose. God, I pray that you continue to reveal this to us, that you continue to open the eyes of our understanding and enlighten us to that truth. Lord, I pray tonight, if there's anybody who came in here with a heaviness on their life, that they can shake off that heaviness, the things that so easily grab a hold of us, so easily distract us, and that, God, we can stay focused on the things that you call are easy and light, the things that burden you, that that's the cause of the kingdom. The cause of the kingdom can be light if we say yes to the call. Tonight, God, I pray for a healing within us. And maybe, maybe there's someone in here tonight that they've been hurt with church. They've been hurt by church. They've been hurt by church people. That, God, there can be a forgiveness and a renewed vision of who you are in relationship to who we are. Man's going to make mistakes, God, but you've never made a mistake. You sent your word to perform it, and it will never return unto you void, but will accomplish exactly what it was set out to do. So tonight we thank you for a healing in the church, in the church at large, church across America, the church globally, God. We pray right now for a healing. We pray for a healing in our government, God. Elections being yesterday, God. We pray for our elected officials that, God, you give them wisdom. Let us not be separated. God, let us find peace and harmony. Make the right decisions. Now, Lord, tonight, if there's anybody in this body who they've come in far from you, that they could find their home with you tonight. That they can say, this is the day. It happened tonight. A good, it happened tonight. Tonight was the night that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And here at Family Church, we pray a simple prayer, and I just ask everyone to pray with me. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I accept you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time tonight, or maybe you just said, hey, you know what? I need an it happened moment. I need a benchmark to say this is where I made things right again. If you fill out that card on the seat back in front of you, we'll we'll send a follow-up to check on you and see if there's any information you'd like to have. If you don't know anything about Christianity, anything about church, anything about family church, there's a book on the seat back in front of you. It's yours. Take it. Um, but we ask that maybe you stop by one of the tables. If you need prayer, deeper prayer than what we did tonight, stop at one of the high top tables. Meet one of our team members back there. Um, if there's something that we haven't mentioned, don't leave here without getting what you came here for. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for a word that will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it out to do. Lord, I thank you tonight that as we lay down to sleep, we will have supernatural sleep, that we will have rest. That person who's been dealing with sleep issues, that they would have a supernatural rest tonight and they would know that it was you touching their body. Father, we thank you. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you.